the government schools continually lie about the origin of the state. And the government apologists, the government uh, court historians, they, they continually lie about the origin of the state. So let's get to the origin really quick. The very first uh, example that we know absolutely for sure of the existence of the state was in the city-state of Jericho about 11,000 years ago. Now, we know this because there was a skirt wall and a tower. And the very first example, uh, Jericho is a, is a slight uh, rocky mound or an outcropping in the Jordan Valley. And so about 11,000 years ago, we know that uh, a group of people um, encamped on that rocky mound and fortified it with a with a skirt wall and a tower. Now archaeology has uh, has shown us this in dating methods and all this kind of thing. So from and then it was about another two or three thousand years before the very next city state appeared, and that was in uh, the neighboring valley of uh, in the Mesopotamian uh, region. So the so the very first state in Jericho existed for a couple thousand years before the second one existed. And this tiny tower, we know that this was the birth of the state because this tiny tower and this little skirt wall could only contain a few dozen people at best. It could not uh, uh, it could not protect the whole residents of the valley. So it's obvious that the that the encampment on Jericho was meant to protect the elite from the residents of the valley. Um, and so we have all the evidence there of the state. We have taxation. We have the the overproduction of grain, monocropping. We have um, the the garrison on Jericho. Uh, we have we have every aspect to show that this is that the state actually did exist there, completely on its own, completely um, without any threat of any exterior state. The only threat to the to the state on at Jericho at the mound in Jericho was the residents of the valley uh, of the Jordan if they didn't want to be taxed, if they wanted to reject their their leaders. And I've gone before and shown how the um, uh, the mythology was created to uh, to justify these uh, these robbers, this robber's roost in Jericho. And what what actually took place was that a, a mythology. Well, there was this uh, there was this religion of this shepherd god, and he was often worshipped in caves or on tops of mountains, and there would be altars or there would be different worshiping areas for this uh, for this shepherd god. So these thieves in Jericho were able to um, usurp this mythology of the shepherd god. And they eventually made him into a god of, uh, of you know, food and eventually bread and specifically grains and so forth. And, uh, and, and grain was the handy thing because you could tax grain. You can't tax. Uh, it's much more difficult to tax other commodities of the time, but you could tax grain. So, um, so, the, so the state was born in Jericho when these robbers, these thieves, were able to convince the you know the neighboring um, valley that they were the priests of this shepherd god that they converted into a god of bread, and now so we have this group of priests on this uh, on this temple mound, and um, and they're worshiping this god and they're requiring a tax uh, an offering from the valley to appease this God and, and you know, uh, make sure that the weather is good and the harvest is good and, and all these things. And the state, of course, is offering protection. But protection from who? There was no other states. So, so you know, thieves oftentimes will offer you protection uh, from other thieves if you pay them enough. And they often do this without your necessarily without your approval, without you voluntarily being a part of it. I mean, that's what mafias do. That's what gangs have done throughout, you know, throughout history. And that's exactly what was taking place in Jericho. And that's exactly what governments are. They're just an organized mob of thieves that promise us protection. But we don't really have a choice in the matter. So uh, to run down the, the list here, um, as it happened in Jericho and as it happened in every other place where the state appeared, you start out with thieves, uh, you know, uh, uh, robbers, and they uh, eventually develop a robber's roost and fortify it. And then they develop the myth of the thieves as priests appointed by God to rule. 
And then, you know, the old saying is that scum rises to the top. So among the thieves, some one will be stronger than the others. And um, uh, there will develop a natural leader among the thieves. And so he becomes king. Well, the, the myth has to shift slightly. So oftentimes that king is then recognized as a god. In, in, in other words, so the priests are no longer uh, recognizing the old god. Now they've got a new god. And so the king becomes God. Now, eventually, this king dies. Maybe you can convince the next generation that that uh, that the next king is God too. But it's a little. At some point in time, it becomes a little hard to support this story, especially when the son is less than the father. So then you have the story. Well, well, he's the son of the of the old king. Therefore, he's the son of a god, and therefore, you know, he can perpetuate this rule. Well, eventually, he, the king is a descendant of the god. He's not the god, but he's a descendant of the god. And so, eventually, that story falls apart. And so now we say, well, the king is appointed by God. And that's where you get to the divine right of kings. The the, the king himself is no longer a divinity. The king has lost his divinity, but you still have the divine right of the king because he's appointed by God. Well, at some point in history, and in, in the case of English history, this took place about the, about the time of the signing of the Magna Carta. But at some point in history, it becomes, uh, it becomes obvious that the king holds his power essentially because he has surrounded himself with people with power. So in the case of England, uh, around the time of the signing of the Magna Carta, you had something introduced called common consent. And you see this, uh, you see this mentioned uh, quite often about that time frame in English history. And, but you have to keep in mind, this is not when we say common consent. We weren't talking about the commoners. We were talking about the common consent of the other lords. You see, in England, the king was just one of the lords. He wasn't necessarily appointed by God or descended from God. He was just the most successful of the thieves. So um, so then we it evolved, especially in English history, it evolved to the point where there was a parliament. Okay, well, parliament comes from the French word to parler, uh, which means to speak. But in this case, the use of the word parliament didn't mean to speak or to talk. It meant to come to a conclusion, to decide. So the parliament, uh, George W. Bush would have loved this concept. The parliament was the deciders, see. Um, and, and again, this is, even though this has the hints of democracy, it's all a lie. First off, the parliament has no, uh, no natural right to decide what a law is or, or to inflict a law or to have any decision about the, the uh, process. And they certainly, even though they lie and they say they represent the people, they are not the people. You can't, you can't have the will of the people represented by a small pocket of people because uh, how, how can they be? They can't know what the mind of all those people are. Unless you magically believe that these parliamentarians are somehow above or better than the rest of all of, the, of humanity. And that's where the myth really starts to fall apart. So, so once they've accepted this common consent, and once that's moved on to become a parliament, then this idea of democracy starts to come in. And the idea of having this king appointed by God, it, the, the story's full of holes to begin with, but then it really falls away. But now you have this myth of democracy. Now all of a sudden the people are ruling. Well, they're not really. They're, it's still just a small committee of humans telling everybody else what to do. So every step in this process is a faith-based assumption that the state is good. Every step in this process is a religious justification for a small group of humans to aggress on the rest of humanity and to live off of our sweat and off of our toil. All of this, this whole process is nothing more than a religion. And it's not Islam and it's not Christianity and it's not Judaism and it's not any other uh, of that kind of religion. It's a far more powerful religion that grasps people's minds and they don't even know they believe it and yet they're dedicated to it. I want to differentiate between government and state. 
government, when we, we a lot of people use these words interchangeably, and I would, you know, if I had a better word to use than state, I would use it. If there was some some way to come up with a new word, and for people to be able to understand it, I would I would happily uh, abandon what I'm about to say and adopt this new word. But we don't have a new word, so I'm stuck with the definitions that we have. So I see the when I talk about the government, I see the government as being all those people that wear costumes and and inflict upon us, the, you know, all the rules and the laws and all that stuff. Those people are the government, but the state is the concept, the the faith in in people's minds that tells them that government is legitimate, and and the echo out from this, the waves that that perpetuate out from that core belief that that this belief that some human beings have the right to lord upon other human beings to place their will upon other human beings and to live off the sweat of other human beings the idea that that is right and good that's the state and once you adopt the state the things that ripple out away from that become the idea that the, that the government can authorize corporations and those corporations can be um, in many ways have the same rights as human beings even though there's no single person that owns and controls it and in many ways those corporations are exempt from the regular rules that you and I live by just like government uh, people in government are to a large part ex uh, exempt from the rules that the rest of us have to live by it's okay for the cop to walk down the street with uh, any number of weapons that the regular mundanes like us are not allowed to walk around with. It's okay for a judge, a so-called judge, to uh, sit in a court and give his judgment. And then, a cops goes out, the, then the cops go out and enforce that judgment. But what if you tried that? You see, so government exists by laws that don't apply to the rest of us. And the, and the laws that the government in, uh, puts down upon us, it itself doesn't have to live by. And so it's done the same thing with corporations and the same thing with central banking and the same thing with the, with the mass media. You know, the, the, the media exists as an aspect of, uh, of the state, of this bigger mythology, and they supply the lies that support uh, all this whole mythology. So when we talk about the government, we're talking about one aspect of the state, one aspect of this greater myth of the state. Okay, now, uh, I want to I want to point this out, because whether we're talking about an atheist or a theist or anywhere in between or any side branches of that, if you believe this myth that the government is is justified in behaving the way that it behaves. If you believe this myth that it's okay for corporations to do stuff that regular people can't do, if you believe this myth that a corporation is uh, has the rights of a human being, if you believe all these lies that come to us from the mythology of the state, whether you call yourself an atheist or, an, or a theist or a Christian or a Muslim or whatever you call yourself, you are actually believing the religion of, God, of, the, of the state. You have adopted and, and are a defender of the faith in your God, the state. And that might be offensive, but if you really think about it, it's the truth. The state is a religion. The state has priests. The state has its tithes, its required offerings. It, it, the, state has, uh, the state allows prayer. You can petition the government. How do you petition the government? Well, you can write you can write a letter to your congressman. You can go and vote. You can, you know, a vote is an individual petition to government. Well, that's what prayer is. Prayer is to petition your God. When you petition your God in prayer, that's the same as when you petition your government with your vote or when you petition a politician with a letter to him saying, "Please, Please, can I have more soup? Please, can you can you not tax me so badly? Please, can I can I carry some types of muted weapons to defend myself with? Please, can I have your permission to carry a weapon? If you're doing that, if you're doing any of those things, you are petitioning your God with prayer. So then, so then, if if we can't trust in the government. And we can't trust in democracy to tell us what is good and what is bad and what is right and what is wrong. Then what can we fall back upon?
What really are our morals based on? Are, are our morals based upon what a bunch of people say? Are, are our morals based upon what a committee says? What central planning tells us? Is that what our morals are based on? Because if they are, then you've got morals based on something that is changeable and flexible and is based on what other people can get from you. As we pursue what is right and what is wrong, there is one easy standard. Did aggression take place? Does aggression have to take place to support this? If, if, if this thing, whatever it is, whatever you're judging, if it must have aggression to support itself, then it is immoral. And this is, whether we want to call this the zero aggression principle or the non-aggression principle or the non-aggression axiom or any of the other terminology that's been placed upon it, when we understand that aggression is wrong, the initiation of violence is wrong, whether I do it or whether you do it or whether someone does it in a costume, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if 10 people vote and an and, and 11th person acting on the behalf of the 10 comes to you and does anything that's aggressive, it's still immoral. Uh, a democracy or a vote or authority from a king, nothing else can make that anything other than act of immorality. And so then we have to understand that every single act of government is based on aggression. Every penny that they have is, is stolen money that they have taken from the, from the productive. You know, I talk pretty regularly about uh, Franz Oppenheimer. And um, he says there's, there's two ways, or he said, he's gone now, but he said there's two, two methods that a person satisfies their wants and needs. And one method is that you work and trade, uh, you use the sweat of your own brow, and, and you, uh, you create and, and uh, you know, you create wealth, you, you grow things, you work and you do things for yourself, and then you freely exchange those things with other people. And in doing so, you get what you want and they get what they want. That's one method. Uh, that's what he calls the economic means. And then there's the other method. The other method is you take what someone else has done. You take the labor of someone else. You take uh, what belongs to someone else. And he called that the political method or the political means. Now, there's only two, these two means. There's only these two methods. You either do it for yourself and then you freely exchange with someone else and you and through voluntary exchange you you obtain what you want that's one way or you steal it there's really only those two ways and all government all government is based on the theft of the of of the of the sweat and of the labor of those those productive people who are are actually um, doing something good for the economy so then all government as we know it today all government is evil you don't have to have the government. All these things are just pacifiers that the government has given to people to to fool them into into believing that they actually uh, need the government. Um, when in reality, the government does not supply any of these things. It's just like a pacifier given to a child. They you know they suck on it, but it never produces anything for them. But they believe in it anyway. And if you try to take that pacifier away from a child, then they get very upset because they think you're taking something from them. But really, that pacifier is giving them nothing. It's interfering in their process of realizing how hungry they are. And that's all that these other excuses are. So so it so the answers do exist where would we have roads how would we have computers who would control how would there be justice who would protect us from the evil you know monsters in other countries that are different from us there are answers to all these questions but you can't find those answers until you first let go of the mythology that the state is the answer and unless you let go of that mythology first then you can never grasp what's beyond it.